But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. If you are not setting your mind on the things of God or on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Our first point tonight we'll find in verses 13. Through six, uh, 13 through 16 is uh, the point, who is the Christ? Now before we dive right into that point, it's uh, like Bobby said this morning, it's important to understand context, right? We're starting in Matthew 16. I guess this is a hint. There's 15 chapters before this chapter, right? There's, Christ is not beginning his ministry. He has not just called his disciples. Uh, Christ is well into his ministry at this point. Uh, he's alone with his disciples here. Um, Matthew is writing this gospel. Matthew uh, was a ta- Jewish tax collector. Uh, Ma- in the gospel Mark and Luke, he's referred to the name Levi. He must have had two names, and that's the reason for him being called Levi and Mark and Luke and Matthew in this one. But nevertheless, uh, this Jewish tax collector who was a disciple of Christ is now writing this gospel. Um, many people think it's to a Jewish audience because of the, of the use of heavy Old Testament references. Constantly, scriptures being brought up from the Old Testament, and it was fulfilled, and it was fulfilled, and it was fulfilled, the prophecy fulfilled. All these prophecies are being fulfilled in Christ. All these references to the Old Testament of a prophet to come, a king to come. Jesus was constantly being shown in Matthew's gospel to be fulfilling these text. And the theme of this gospel, you would say, is that Jesus is the long-awaited God, long-awaited Messiah. There's 400 years of silence uh, from Malachi, right, the last book of the Old Testament, until John the Baptist comes to the scene. There's no prophet. There's no spokesman for God. The Jewish people seem to be abandoned by God. They're left waiting is God going to fulfill his promises? Will there be a great prophet? Will the Messiah come? And so here, we see in Matthew 16, Jesus being revealed as the Messiah. And so, I'll read this here. When they came to the district of Assessory Philippi, a Roman province, um, Jesus must get alone with his disciples. There's no big crowds. There's no Pharisees and Sadducees as Jewish rulers, but he has some alone time here, him and his disciples. And so we get insight of Jesus alone with his disciples, and what does he teach them? What does he ask them? He asks them, what, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? He's curious. Of course, he probably already knows the answer. He's God, but he wants an answer. Who do they say? They say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. All positive responses. Good answers, right? Positive. Prophet. Great. It's just ironic that they're all positive when the text right before that, we see the, Jesus um, you know, arguments with the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're demanding signs. Jesus refuses to give them one. And then he even tells his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. I Meaning, beware of their teaching. Jesus has rivals. Jesus has enemies. And yet when he asks this question, the disciples give all positive answers. Nevertheless, it's not the right answer. Good, however they may be. And ironically, the two first answers are the same, essentially. John the Baptist and others say Elijah. Elijah... Um, 
in Malachi 4, 5, uh, second last verse of the whole entire Old Testament for us, um, says Elijah will come again, right? Who is Elijah? A lot of people are thinking it's Jesus. He's the prophet that was supposed to come. However, we see in Matthew 17, um, 17, 12, he says, But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Jesus is telling them later that the two answers they give were the same person. And so ironically, they say John the Baptist when John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, and they lived at the exact same time. But with this rumor probably spread it from Matthew 14, when Herod um, was, fear, was fearing that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, and it was Jesus, because Jesus' fame is just now getting popular around uh, Matthew 14. So people are starting to hear about Jesus. His ministry is growing. His fame is growing. John the Baptist is dead, and now they're seeing uh, it's Jesus, John the Baptist, come back. Another ministry is coming up, another Jewish prophet. Um, and then Jeremiah, one of the prophets, it just once again enforces the point that Jesus' ministry, all right, it's powerful, it's great. Um, but the correct answer comes, in the, comes from the, uh, the next question. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? In verse 15, Simon or Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter's answer is correct. Uh, we, Jesus affirms this answer, right? He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Jesus affirms the title of Messiah. Jesus agrees with Peter and the disciples, yes, I am the Messiah. The question given for us today is the same question Jesus asked the disciples. Who do you say that I am? Very, very important question for us to sit and think, is Jesus a great teacher? Did Jesus have a great ministry? Was Jesus an old guy who lived and died and religion, religious people followed him? Or was he the Messiah? Was he the son of the living God? And if so, if it is true, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us today? It means he, de- we, he deserves our worship. Because Jesus was the Messiah. And he was God. And he is God. He's alive today. The second question we find in our text in, in the next verses, 17 through 20. Who is the church? It says, And Jesus answered and blessed you, Simon Barjona, for the flesh and blood is not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven. The, um, the subject, right, or the uh, main focus leaves Jesus and goes to someone else. It goes to Peter and his church. We're no longer focused on who is the Christ. We're focused on who is the Christ's church. Uh, you see Jesus affirm Peter's answer. And then he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Uh, flesh, right? Our own strength, our own will, our own ability to save ourselves. Jesus puts this notion aside. You cannot save yourself. Not your flesh, not your strength, not your power, and not your bloodline. Which may have struck a chord into Matthew's Jewish audience. They thought, right, I'm a Jew. The promise is given to Abraham and his descendants. The promise in Genesis 12. I'll make a great nation out of you. And yet here, Jesus says something very interesting. Not flesh and blood, but the Father. The Father has divinely acted in, from heaven and has opened Peter's eyes to the truth about Christ. That is Jesus of Nazareth. That he is the long way to the Messiah. What does that mean for Peter? He says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There's a lot of controversy on who the rock is. 
It's, um, if you know Peter in Greek is Petros. So if you read this in the Greek, you are Petros, and on this Petros, it's hard to um, separate Peter and the rock. Now the rock is the foundation uh, that he will build his church. Now foundation, not necessarily um, the power and the strength, but the first, we see, maybe first Christian, right? He starts with Peter and the apostles. And those who Jesus reaches and the apostles reach until today. It's being laid. First it was Peter. But the rock uh, should not get in the way of who is actually doing the building. It's Christ. It says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The power is coming from the Father who reveals right, that, that Jesus is the Christ. And it's the Son, Jesus, who is building his church on the rock. The Father uh, makes Peter the rock. And then Jesus is building on top of it. We, we we're uh, quick to look at who the rock is. And there's a lot of controversy within the Catholic Church and Protestants. Is, is Jesus the rock? Is this confession the rock? Is Peter the rock? I think it is Peter. I think it is his confession. I think it is Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. Uh, the two main things that I really want to look in this text is, one, it says the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Uh, the gates right, of a kingdom was um, a signal of strength, of power. And so many kingdoms, what they would do is what, they would cover their gates, their wooden gates with bronze, to make the kingdom look strong. And so here, the gates... Of hell, right? The signal of strength of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell most likely were very strong, for they keep they kept the dead inside of them. And Jesus is saying, the power of death will not prevail against his church. And then he goes on to say, I will give you the king the keys of the kingdom and of heaven, and wherever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. We know what the keys of the kingdom of heaven is. The keys to the kingdom is the gospel. It's the good news that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And if you repent and have faith in Jesus as Messiah, you can have eternal life. Paradise. Forever. And these keys are given to the church. Those who confess Jesus as Christ. And it says, wherever you shall bind, wherever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. It's uh, given a, a look into church discipline, it would seem that whatever is allowed on earth, right, whatever we should be allowing on, on earth. Well, not necessarily the earth, but the church. On earth meaning the church on earth, because that's the context that uh, the Christ is talking about, is his church on earth should be bounding on earth, what will be bound in heaven. There is a, a standard, a code in heaven. There is no sin in heaven. And there should be no sin in his church on earth. And it's up to the church today to fulfill these things that Christ has commanded. Bind on earth what will be bound in heaven. It says, Then he strictly charged disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And this kind of, this text uh, connects our second point to our third point of who the church is. The church is those who confess Jesus as the Christ. And it's curious that if Jesus is the Christ, why would he tell his disciples to tell no one that he's the Christ? The word Christ, the Messiah, meant the anointed one. Uh, usually referenced in the Old Testament as the king. Uh, David's descendant who would rule on the throne forever. And so this is probably the thoughts of the disciples, of Peter, when he says, you are the Christ. You are the king that is to come and rule. There's 400 years of silence and the Jews uh, under, uh, enslaved by the Romans, right? They've gone to Babylon. They've gone to uh, exile. And here they are waiting for the Messiah. And yet they found him. You are the Christ. You've come to rule and power. 
And Jesus is telling them, don't tell anyone. Because they don't fully understand yet who the Messiah is and what he is to do. We see in the next text, he says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Here, Peter um, is evidence for that point of what they thought the Messiah was. This king who's going to rule. And Jesus says, I must suffer and I must die. I must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And Peter goes, no, no, no. That's not what the king does. The king rules and conquers. Here we see a backwards idea. We do not, Peter doesn't understand what he's saying. He's trying to prevent Jesus from doing the very thing he came to earth to do. Jesus fixed his eyes to Jerusalem. His ministry is changing. The Galilean ministry is over, and he is headed towards Jerusalem to die for sinners. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. 1 Timothy 1.15 1 Timothy 1.15 Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name and so that at the name of Jesus every name should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of God the Father. Um, it's, the, it's the gospel. Jesus came to die for sinners. And on the cross, he did not just die, but he took on the wrath of God. In the garden, sweating drops of blood was not because he was a coward. Because many people have faced death. There have been many martyrs who went brave. And Jesus is sweating in the blood, asking the Father, is there another way? It's not because it's just any ordinary death. It's because the wrath of our sin that was deserved for us was going to be put on his shoulders. It was not just a physical pain, but it was separation from the Father. That's what he was fixing his eyes for Jerusalem. He was going there. He was going to be shamed, mocked, beaten, physically abused, and spiritually. He would be separated from the Father, bearing wrath for us. This very thing that Peter was rebuking was the very thing that was going to save him. Jesus' response seems to uh, then um, be uh, equally as harsh as it may be um, deserved for Peter. He says, um, But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. Men do not want to suffer. We avoid suffering. We want ease. We want comfort. But Jesus did not come for those things. He came to do the will of the Father. And that meant suffering and dying for those very people that were causing the suffering and caused his death. Here, though, Jesus is predicting his own death. That means uh, it was not a surprise to him. He knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. It was not an accident that he was on the cross. He did not get caught in the upper room or out in the garden. He knew what Jesus was going to do. He says, I have, um, no one takes his life from him. Right? He gives it. And that's what he's going to do. Christ's suffering was the sovereign plan of God. Before the foundation of the world, 
Christ is going to come and save sinners. And our last point we see corresponds with this. Because Christ, the church, Christ, the church, who is the Christ, who is the church, the Christ must suffer. And now we see the church must suffer as well. Jesus gives two illustrations. He says, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And the other illustration is a hypothetical situation that Jesus gives. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Obviously, you can't gain the whole world. You cannot, can't attain it. But the hypothetical situation Christ gives is that if we got what our sinful, fleshly desires wanted, everything to go our way, the whole world was ours, all of nature, you would lose your soul. If you refuse to suffer, for who? It says, uh, but whoever loses his life for my sake. If you were to gain the whole world and have all the earthly desires you wanted and refuse to suffer for the sake of Christ, you will lose your soul. You will not have eternal life. You will not have life on earth to its full capacity. Because life comes from the Father. Life comes from God comes from Jesus. Jesus gave life. And here you see the other illustration. Take up his cross and follow me. The cross has maybe lost its um, shock effect for today. Uh, we um, see it on necklaces and bracelets and things like that. Um, to us, maybe the cross would look better as an um, electric chair. The disciples, when they heard this phrase, most likely you were taken back a little bit. Because they knew if you were to take up your cross, that meant you were on your way to be hung by it, to be nailed to it. As if for us to pick up our electric chair and go to our death. And he says, you should do this all the time. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take up his cross and follow me is, is a daily task. We don't, we don't crucify people today. But we, as Christians, should be crucifying our flesh. Nailing it to the cross. And there's a, um, there's a common illustration that I've heard. Um, when a Christian, when someone becomes a Christian, they nail their flesh to the cross of Christ. You see that in Colossians. And it says that every day, the old self struggles a little bit. And loosens up those nails. And every day we have to go back and nail them in again and again. Another illustration I've heard is uh, we want to give God our life. Here's a $10,000 check, Father. Here's my life. This is what it's worth. And God says, good, but I want it a quarter every single day until you die. Daily. Denying ourselves. Taking up our cross and following him. Jesus, once again, predicting his death because he has not been hung on the cross yet. But he says, follow me. Take up your cross because he's going to Jerusalem to die. And so this is the point for us then. How should we suffer? Suffering should be a trademark for the Christian life. Half of the Psalms is a lament. The other wisdom literature is Job, Ecclesiastes. God has given us much scripture on suffering. Beloved, Job is 42 chapters long. Much of it poetry. On a man suffering. God is telling us. Suffering is not quick. It is not easy. But suffering is long. And is hard. And is given to us by God as a gift. He has given us uh, his grace to endure it. You see, uh, Hebrews 12, 
3 through 11. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of the spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here in Hebrews, uh, the author tells us it's a sign. Discipline, suffering is a sign. We are chosen by God. Now, we are part of his church, and we see this in the context here. Uh, Christ must suffer, and those who follow him, who are with him, who are his, will suffer also. The servant is not greater than its master. John 15, 1 through 2, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, uh, may bear more fruit. Pruning is not a... A pretty sight, especially when we think of pruning a human, right? I mean, obviously he's talking spiritually. Pruning. Allowing suffering. Allowing hurt. For those who he loves, because it's best for them. And then the text in First Peter. First Peter is my favorite book. So uh, I love this text right here. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, he's talking about our salvation. If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so the tested genuineness, genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, those tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He gives the imagery of gold being refined by fire. Not a pretty sight. And that is our faith. God puts it under fire, melts it. Let's all the bad rise to the top and they scrape it off. And that gold is finer then than it was before. And that's why it goes to the furnace. And then later he says in 10, verses 10 through 12, the current turning of the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ. And the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. The things that have now been announced to you. Through those who preach the good news to you. By the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things to which angels long to look. The prophets. Who prophesied of Jesus coming. The long way to Messiah. The thought, the, the thought the prophets had was the suffering commonly got overlooked by the Jewish people of Jesus' time. It says here, the predict the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. The suffering comes, then the glory. The title of my sermon tonight, No Cross, No Crown. The famous writing by William Penn is evident and true here. Without a cross, there is no crown. For Christ and for us. So earlier in the text, he is now at the throne by his father in glory. And that is where we will go to if we endure, if we persevere, the suffering that is to come to us. We suffer in many ways as a church. We suffer in showing grace and forgiving, forgiving others of our sins. Bobby preached a very good sermon this morning on the unity in Christ. As brothers and sisters in Christ, how we must forgive. How things are said intentionally. 
and unintentionally. And beloved, to forgive someone means you must suffer. You give them grace and you receive nothing. You suffer. It's hard. Hard work. We suffer in abstaining from sin. Uh, this is 1 Peter 4. It says, And therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge and living, living the dead. And that's that last ending part, right? We suffer when we abstain from sin. Sanctification. Pursuing holiness. Working now, right, with, with the work with the Holy Spirit to be on, on our path to what we will be one day. Righteous, holy, seeing Christ face to face, beloved. Uh, we will get that then. If we have faith in Christ and pursue sanctification, salvation is justification, it is also sanctification. And then we see at the end, he says, Give account to him who is ready to judge. That part in First Peter. We see that in verse 27 of Matthew. He says, For the Son of Man is coming to with him with his angels and glory. Of his father, and then he will pay each person according to what he's done. Here, to help us endure suffering, um, Jesus um, gives us a uh, warning of judgment. That he is the Son of Man, and he is the Messiah, and one day he will come. Much like the, the Peter and the apostles thought he would come then, he'd come then, the first coming of Christ. No, they were more thinking of the second coming of Christ. When he comes in glory and righteousness to rule. And there he will judge each person according to what he has done. Written in the context of suffering. How have we suffered? How have we endured for the sake of Christ? A lot of people suffer. A lot of people don't suffer for Jesus. Is God glorified in your suffering? Does God get praised by your suffering? Do people look at your life and are they curious why? How? And are you pointing them to your answer, Jesus Christ? He took up his cross for us. So now we take up our cross because of him. And then verse 28, he gives promise along with the judgment. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There are many thoughts on what that may mean, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Most people say there's a transfiguration, which comes um, directly after this passage. They see Jesus in his glory. They get a little taste of what's to come. A little taste that the suffering that they are to endure is worth it. They should press on. And lastly, I want to talk about suffering in a different way. Suffering with those keys to the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus um, gives to the church. His keys being the gospel. How are we suffering with those keys that he has given us? Are we suffering to preach the gospel? To spread his gospel? And uh, something that's very um, dear to me, and hopefully it's dear to you all, is global missions. The unreached. And when I say unreached, I mean those, um, I don't mean lost. There are not unreached people in Rock Hill, South Carolina. There are not unreached people where you work. There are lost people where you work. And how do I know that they're not unreached? It's because you're there. They're in your office. They're in your neighborhood. They're in your city. And therefore, they're not unreached. They have been reached the gospel. They can go down the street. You can go to them down the street, take a drive in your car, and present the keys to how they can have eternal life forever. However, they're unreached. When I mean unreached is they don't have a Christian around them to preach them the gospel. They don't have the scripture written in their language. 
They will die not knowing who Jesus Christ was, never having mentioned to them, never having read a Bible verse a day in their life, and they will go to hell. That is bad news. And they do not have the good news. The spirit of global missions, though, begins with the spirit of evangelism in our own community. I think we did a great job at VBS going door to door in our, our neighborhoods, reaching those who are lost, and that is beginning, and that may be a spark that this church needs. To go and reach those who do not know Christ. But beloved, the Great Commission says go to the ends of the earth. Will we obey Christ? Are we working for the Great Commission? To send people or to go people? Are we sending people out? Are we providing money, prayers for people? Or are we to be the ones to go? To pick up your cross was something real for the disciples. They all became missions, missionaries. They all died. Do not look at your circumstance and say, it's not me. I'm not the one to go. But ask God, am I the one to go? There are many reasons to not go. But there's only one reason that you should go. God is calling you. Ask monthly, regularly, not once and let it be. Is God calling me to go reach those who will die and go to hell and never have the good news preached to them? Um, the disciples died, all of them, martyrs except John. He was said to have boiled in oil and sent us to exile on an island. Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't find himself worthy to die in the same death as Jesus. Many of the disciples were beheaded and crucified. And, uh, there are many martyrs even today across the world who pick up your cross it means more to them than it does to us. And then we go back to our example from earlier, and this is where we close. John Rogers, sentenced to death by burning at the stake, walked to his death, stared out in the audience to see his wife and his 11 children. Seeing his youngest for the first time at his death. He died there, burning at the stake. But soon, there was an uproar of cheering. It was said to seem like he was on his way to a wedding, rather than to be killed. He sparked what became a trademark of boldness and bravery in the killings of the Reformation. There are martyrs still today who are brave and bold, and they are following in their master's footsteps. Let us endure suffering and sanctification and spreading the gospel. And bearing with on their sins. And perhaps, if God is gracious to us, that some of us here may live to be martyrs. So let's walk in our, father, in our master's footsteps and endure the suffering to come. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Your mercy is anew every day, Lord. Help us, Father. Give us your grace. Give us your Holy Spirit to pick up our cross and to follow our Savior. He died for our sins, Father, and that is the reason why we now should endure our crosses. We should pick up our crosses. Help us, Father, to love one another. Help us to love you, God. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.